Welcome everyone to the Contact Center Perspectives Podcast. I'm Steve McDonald, your host. And today we've got a very special guest on. We've got Gemma De Palma. And Gemma, you are the COO of Foria. And what we're going to be talking about today is how do we create the ideal hybrid customer happiness team? So to focus on the long-term success of our business, so reliant on the happiness of our customers. And you're going to focus on and talk a lot about that happiness factor has a lot to do with our own internal teams and how we treat them and the culture that we create. But you've got a pretty varied background and I'll get into just a little bit of it. You're a cookbook author. You also are a consultant with Accenture. You've consulted for a number of years, but why don't you expand a little bit on that background that I just gave there to give us a little bit more rounded view of who you are and talk about Foria before we get started. Sure. Steve, thank you so much for having me. First of all, I really appreciate it. I'm excited to be here. My background is quite varied. You are correct. I come really from the food world as well as the retail consulting world, as you mentioned. My background is in R&D, product development, supply chain, logistics, and how does that relate to customer happiness? You may be wondering. All of it actually ultimately lands with the customer. So when products we're developing, supply chain, can we get the product to the customer? All lands to servicing your end user and your consumer. So that is my background before I joined Foria. And I joined Foria five years ago as director of supply chain, now I'm Foria COO. I still manage all those areas of product development, supply chain, and logistics. In addition to that, customer happiness does sit underneath me. So it's really great to have the whole product life cycle from start to finish and our products end up in the consumer's hands. I love the holistic viewpoint that you have because in a lot of companies, the contact center, the customer happiness team is viewed as a cost center, a necessary evil. <laughs> and you have a very dramatically different point of view on that. Tell us a little bit about Foria so we understand the industry that you're playing with. And then I want to jump right in then to this customer happiness team and talk a little bit more about that. Sure. So Foria's mission is to bring more pleasure to more people. We really focus on females' intimate well-being across their lifespan, and we address time of day, time of month, and time of life. And that really shows up in our products that are intimacy, relief, and vibrance line. And that's really important because we are discussing very intimate topics with our customers. So we really need a strong customer happiness team so customers can outreach, they can be comfortable, they can be knowledgeable. They have what's considered like embarrassing questions because it's all about our bodies and our experiences with these three areas. And we want to make sure our customer happiness team have the tools and the knowledge to really support the end user that's reaching out to them. You may have some of those intricacies about Foria and the customers in product that you have, but what you're going to talk about here today, is it limited to Foria or is this advice that you think covers the entire industry? I really think this advice covers the entire industry because there is always an opportunity with a customer. The majority of customers reach out to complain about something. They haven't had a good experience, whether they shipment was late or they haven't liked the product. So when they're reaching out to you, how can you turn that complaint, that unsatisfied customer into an opportunity to either try a new product, to experience the company in a different way, to change the negative into a positive? And I think if you're selling something, it could be across all channels that you can make this into a great opportunity to connect with your customer and expand. If you could tell me before we talk about the makeup of the customer happiness team, sure. talk maybe a little bit more about how it's so holistic, so interconnected with all the other different sure. departments that you can't really look at the customer happiness team on its own as a silo, as a department. Right. So we definitely don't have our customer happiness team sitting over here where the rest of the company operates over here. And it's very important to us that our customer happiness team is integrated with our marketing team, is integrated with our operations team. That's actually why it sits with me because they need to know inventory levels. If we're running out of something, for example, if there are any price changes, they need to be on the front line of that information because the customer reaches out to them first, not the person who's doing the price changes or managing inventory. Another really key thing is our customer happiness team is integrated with our marketing team because marketing team is talking to our customer. But if we send out a promotion 
exciting campaign with language that doesn't land with our customer, our customer happiness team will get those responses from our customer. So if we have a postcard that sends out or a GWP or discount, our customer happiness team works closely with our marketing team to say, hey, this language we used last time, we got a certain number of calls around confusion. Maybe we should change it to this language. So we're utilizing that information from our customer happiness team within our marketing team, which is really important because it's the voice of the customer that's coming through the customer happiness team. So who wouldn't want that in their marketing, right? It's like full circle. It's great. Yeah, but it doesn't happen that much. That's the thing. <laughs> from my understanding, it doesn't happen that much. But at Foria, we want to hear from our customers because we're here in service to them. We're here in service of bringing more pleasure to more people and make the experience of their whole life cycle more pleasurable and more enjoyable. And if we don't hear what they have to say and integrate it in our business, it's a missed opportunity for us. I think it was Gartner who came out within the last year, the recommendation that most CMOs need to act more like chief customer officers. They need to be able to represent the customer, the way the customer thinks, the way the customer talks, the preferences of the customer, all of that. And you've got now this customer happiness team that's talking to the customer every single day. So I think that's already my big takeaways from the podcast here is just this feedback loop, but circular, like it's not a one-way conversation either direction. It's a collaboration. So I think that's really special. Thank you. So tell me a little bit more of the importance of the customer happiness team. What is the ideal customer happiness team? How would you go about putting one together? Sure. For our team specifically, we have a bit of a hybrid team. We have a full-time employee who's been with us several years. We have a part-time employee and we have actually another full-time support staff that has been outsourced. And that is an ideal team for us because customers happen 24-7. I don't want to just be available to our customers five days a week, nine to five, because again, that leaves someone hanging for two to three days if they have a question on a Friday evening, then we can't get to Monday. And if Monday's a holiday, then we don't answer them until Tuesday. So the hybrid team is really great because we can cover more hours, more questions, and we can have faster response time. And I want to be really clear about something. Faster response time doesn't mean faster customer end time and resolution time. For our products in particular, we want to be at first contact with the customer. We also want to take our time with the customer. We want to listen to what they need. We want to answer it. A lot of these products, a lot of the customer inquiries are sensitive in nature. So we don't want to rush the customer, but we want to be really thorough and knowledgeable about the answers we're providing to them. So ideally, it's a hybrid team. So we can really cover more hours and more days of the week. We can take our time with the customers to respond quickly, but take the time to answer properly. So Foria has certain ways that you want to be interacting with your customers. And what I took away from what you said there is that you want to show great empathy. You don't want to rush them. You want to make sure that you know that you really care. That's a very good lesson for everyone. We all want to show empathy for the customer. We all want to show what's right and that we care. So I think where there's maybe some big differences in your business than others, but it's a strong lesson to learn here because that goes in the opposite direction of sometimes the key KPIs that we get judged on. Average handle times, first time resolution. Why is that going up? We care. That's why. We care. Yeah. Right. We're a bit of a different model in that sense. It's the nature of our products. It's empathy. It's active listening is really important and being really solution oriented. It's not just a checkbox off a sheet. Could you translate that? I clearly understand the benefits for the customer in that. What are the benefits for the company in having that kind of empathy, taking that kind of time, doing things right for the customer. How does that translate into a good business practice? If we can turn a customer's experience around, we'll have lifetime value of the customer. They'll be with us through all the phases of our life. Our company is very focused on time of day, time of month, and time of life. That We want to be with our customer's journey as they grow. That's really important to us. And our products overlap so we can support our customers in many different areas of their life with many different products. So we want to have them have a good experience around our customer service. If one product doesn't work for them, another can, and we can still support them in their journey. Do you have a customer story that you wouldn't mind sharing that is just illustrates that loyalty is what every company wants? 
We want people recommending. We want to capture the lifetime value of that customer. Is there anything you could like put that into a story that you could share with us? I think two instances come to mind. We actually have a lot of partners email us and say, I got this for my wife. I've got this for my partner. And I saw her in so much pain when she was going through menopause. And this has been a game changer for us. Thank you. So they're like, what other products do you have? How can I expand this? Because I'm new to this space and I need some guidance and I don't know who to ask. So our customer happiness team will help that person understand our products and understand what may be right for his or her partner to expand on the good experience that they've had. So that's been really rewarding and really satisfying. And then we've had customers who use one of our lines, Intimacy, for example, and then we're like, we want more. And so we can recommend other products and they'll be really excited because they didn't realize, we thought we were just Intimacy line focused on sexual wellness, but now we're midlife and they can expand their product line, expand their pleasure, expand where they in their life and really feel good in their bodies. So that type of knowledge base is really important for our customer happiness team to know, to really understand the issue that someone is calling us about, and then be able to support them with the knowledge and with the products that we have, for example. And then there are customers that call out complaints. Of course, we don't get it right all the time. First one to say that, whether it's a shipping delay or I don't know, maybe a bottle was arrived broken because we do have glass and we'll be able to replace anything if something is arrived damaged. So I think every company does that or should do that, hopefully. So that's another example. Uh, I can give one more example. If a customer is not satisfied with our product, maybe they used a product that they thought would help with one of their intimate experiences and it wasn't the right product for them. They didn't have a good experience. We can refund them their money or we can replace it with a new product. I think it's just that extra step of, okay, you tried this and it didn't work. Let's refund you. We're going to give you this product, or you can try this product and that will work. And one of the things that you said in there, the customer story question was, how does this translate into a good business practice? One of the criteria that you're outlining here is that for the makeup of a good customer happiness team, they have to be able to be good recommenders. They have to be a tour guide. This isn't about answering with pat questions. This is about understanding the needs of the customer and then having and being intuitive enough and trained well enough that you can actually be a consultant, be a recommendation engine for them. That is huge in terms of cross-sell, upsell, loyalty, and impact on the business. And, it really is. And the contact center, the customer happiness team, they don't always get that credit. But how important is that for the company? That leads tremendously to, important. I, I love to get on a scale how you're thinking about this. Like how important is the customer happiness team to the overall growth and the vitality of Foria? One, it's not important at all. Ten, it's vital to the overall growth and vitality of the company. How would you rate that? For our company, I'm going to say it's upwards to a 10. And it works because we integrate it with the rest of our company. And that for us is key. So expand on that a little bit. Go a little bit deeper in terms of like how you want it working together and how it actually ties into growth. Sure. So it's upwards of the 10. And when I say it's important because it integrates with the rest of the company, we have the weekly meetings with marketing. We have the weekly meetings with operations. So they are a key player at the table to let us know what our customers are saying. If I have an issue with a product, they bring it to me directly because they're hearing it. So if I don't hear that, I don't want to keep selling, I don't know, a leaky pump top. Or if a customer isn't getting the proper message, I don't want to lose customers. I need to change things and I can act quickly, but I can't do that if I don't have the customer information and I don't have my head of customer happiness at the table influencing the decisions that I make for the next time we do a product run, for the next marketing GWP, for the next postcard we sell. That's how important it is. And we do have weekly meetings and we have town halls every quarter where customer happiness presents their slide as well, because let's have a view into what customers are saying. What are customers rating our products? How many ratings? And how are they rating us too? So I think that's really important to us. So that's why they're upwards of a 10 is important to the business. And having that proverbial seat at the table, what does that do? Because the industry has a very difficult challenge with agent turnover, very high agent turnover. But being in a position where as an agent, as a part of a happiness team, you actually have a seat at the table that is influencing and 
helping to consult with the rest of the different departments on what we're doing and how we're successful as a company. How does that impact the happiness of the team being an employee of Foria and longevity of that agent or that person in your customer happiness team? What does it do for them? So I think everyone wants to be included. And whether you're a Foria employee or an agent, it is important to be included, to be a part of product launches, to be a part of the town halls, to be a part of the company meetings, because you feel like you're a part of something bigger, which an agent is or an employee is, which is a really great thing. And you feel empowered because you have firsthand knowledge of what's happening in the business. You're not reading it in an email that just comes out. You're not hearing it third, fourth, fifth person. You're at the table hearing like how great the company is doing, for example, or this exciting new product. And the other thing that we do, which is really important, is we send products to all of our employees if we have released a new product, but our agent is included that. If our agent is talking to a customer that has reached out, they need to know how the product works. So of course, we're going to send a product to an agent. They're not going to be excluded from that just because they don't have a Foria employee. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. We're talking about this ideal customer happiness team. How important is trying to reduce agent turnover? So how important is the impact of agent turnover when you're a small company or you're a large company? How important on maybe that same scale, one to 10, is agent turnover to the overall growth of the business? One, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They can turn it over, right? 10, no. Managing that and making sure the customer happiness team themselves is happy, that's a 10. Where would you put that? I do feel like it's a 10. <laughs> I feel like it's very important. The reason why is because our products are so sensitive of nature. It takes a long time to train people. And because we are such a different model, we're like faster isn't better. It's also a specific personality type. Someone who's empathetic, as we talked about, someone who's active listener, someone who can be very solution oriented. So it's really important to find a person with that skill set and then start training them on product knowledge and how Foria works as the ecosystem of Foria and how it works and how we want our customers to be really satisfied with how we greet them and how we invite them into the conversation. We're very lucky because of our model, our customer happiness lead has been with us three years. Our time person has been with us seven years. So it's been really satisfying and exciting to have our people with us for such a long time and also to see their growth and to see what they want to do with customers. There's so many other opportunities that they're exploring and how they're interacting with customers rather than just answering a question now we're looking into surprise and delight customers. Do we send merchandise out as a surprise and delight? How can we up the bar to engage the customer? I think my next question you've already answered, but I'm going to ask it in a different way because it becomes obvious based on the whole conversation we've been having. But the question is around the perception of contact centers as cost centers. And in a lot of companies looked at as this is one of the biggest overhead costs that we have in the business. And so how do we control that? How do we reduce that cost? How do we get our average hand of times down? How do we get our first time response rates up? So what would you say just as a recommendation or share your insights with your peer, your audience that is watching here, your peer group, what's your perspective on the contact center or customer happiness team as a value center versus a cost center? For us, it's a value center because everyone who contacts us, that is an opportunity to turn that customer experience around. That is an opportunity to help educate the customer, to engage the customer, to share the customer other product information and product knowledge. If this product didn't work, maybe this product could work or maybe you weren't using the product correctly. It's an opportunity and it's a marketing opportunity to really turn the sale around and the customer experience around, which I think is important because if you have a good customer, you get something from a company, you don't like it, you call their customer experience, you are going to say to all of your friends, this was an amazing customer experience. I'm going to be loyal to them and I'm going to grow with them because I know they have really good customer happiness team and I know they stand behind their product. If you have a bad experience, you're going to tell so many people that company is the worst. We don't want to be in that category. <laughs> we want to be in the other <laughs> no. category where we're very excited, where customers are excited to really participate in the joy of Foria and our products and participate in learning and growing in the education 
And that really comes from the interaction with the customer happiness team. This interaction with the customer happiness team, a big part of it, answering the questions, satisfying the needs, making recommendations, but also you've got to be really good at turning negative situations into positive. And you've talked about empowering with refunding or sending a new product or things like that. But how important is it the role of the customer happiness team in taking an unsatisfied customer and turning that into a loyal customer? Because we all know the studies all say that can happen. It can happen. Do you train for that? How do you empower your agents to be able to address and take a negative and turn it into a positive like that? A lot of the stuff we talked about, the act of listening, really understanding the issue that the customer is having. And we actually have an escalation process. So if one agent is not getting it, hey, I need help. I'm going to escalate this to my manager. I think that's really key. You cannot be afraid to ask your coworkers questions because that does happen. So support your team, have the escalation process. And then sometimes things will come to me like, hey, this customer asked X, Y, Z. I don't know how to answer it. Okay, let's figure out how to answer it. Let's figure out what we can do. So I think that's a really important thing for customer support, whether it's an agent or someone working at the company. And then how important it is to turn that negative experience into a lifelong customer. That is the goal, which is why we're empowering our customer happiness team to do the refund, replace the product, but also have the support staff of the escalation process. Very important. Another thing that's very important, I want to make sure that we cover this, is you talk right up front about the makeup of the ideal customer happiness team. And you talked about outsourcing. You talked about the importance of that because if you just can't be there full time, outsourcing is very common. Or 70% of companies outsource or looking to outsource. So some of the concerns and challenges that you had before you started outsourcing, just so we get a foundation because everybody's going to say, absolutely, I understand why. But there's a lot of concerns I might have. So we had the concern around if we outsource, will the person be as dedicated? Will the person that we outsource to really understand our products? Will they understand the company? Will they understand the mission? Because our customer happiness is so important to us. So that's a concern. Are they going to be bought into the brand and want to like cheer for us? Like we cheer for ourselves. We're invested in this brand. If you outsource, will they be as invested? It's a big question and it's a big risk. How we got around that are all the things I mentioned, including that person in the town halls, including that in company meetings, in product launches, sending whoever you outsource to the product. If they're answering your customer happiness questions, they have to understand the product. They have to feel it. They have to touch it. They have to experience it. So that inclusion is really key. And it really quieted any fears that we've had. We've had an incredible experience outsourcing. So basically you treat them as if they were a part of your in-house team. Is that a good way to think about it? Yes, absolutely. They are part of our in-house team. They are included in Foria as a company and what we do as a company. And they're, as I mentioned, from product launches to campaigns to GWPs, they know everything at the get-go and they're not chasing for information. That then comes to, I guess you would call like the culture of the company and the atmosphere and the way that you treat your agent for the folks that are listening here today, what's your advice for others that are running a customer happiness team, a contact center? What's your advice for them? I think it's similar to what I just said. I keep coming to this word inclusion, but I think that is really important. The inclusion of your contact center in your business and not looking at it as a driving cost, looking at it really as a marketing opportunity to expand your business, looking at it as a way to learn more about your customers so you can make more informed decisions about your customers. There's so much information that you can mine from the customer service team, whether they're outsourced or not. But if they're outsourced, there's still great information. So partner with them to get that information to grow your business. And what would you say if you had the opportunity to, and you're a CEO, but if you're talking to another CEO, I love the way that you're talking about this. What would you recommend to that CEO in terms of you can't just look at the cost and maintaining cost and track two or three of the key KPIs and make sure that they're always increasing or doing the trend that you want them to, that there's so much more to it. How would you just in a conversation say, you've got to change your perspective? I'm going to go back to the beginning of our conversation and 
really talk about it as a holistic business view. That's what I would say, because the customer happiness service center doesn't live outside your business. If you look at it as a holistic business view and everything you're doing from products development to logistics, supply chain, marketing, you are doing that all for your customer. So you can get whatever it is you're producing to your customer's hands. It has to be a holistic part of the business. I think that would be my number one advice to anyone looking to outsource or grow their customer team or what can I do and how can I make this more of an opportunity than just a straight cost? Fantastic. If there was one thing that you wanted people to take away from everything we've talked about here, you're going to remember one thing. This is what I want you to remember. I think it's similar to what I just said. The customer happiness team really is a golden nugget that's overlooked. But if you really look at that nugget and make it a whole part of your team and a holistic view, it can really impact your business in such a positive way. And you can learn more about your customer and you can meet your customer needs and grow your business in a way that really is very exciting and sky's the limit. I love how you said that there. You used a word in there that you haven't used yet which was undervalued. I think to me, the big takeaway here is there's so much potential. There's so much value to be gained from actually making that customer happiness team so much more of a holistic part of your company. If people had follow-on questions for you, what would be the best way that they could get a hold of you? Would, is it okay if we maybe provide your link on LinkedIn? You can provide me on LinkedIn, no problem. Absolutely. Gemma De Palma. No problem. You can include my email if you would like, Gemma at Fantastic. Thank you so that much would be great. for coming on. Thank you for having me.